Welcome to the Beyond Sunday podcast, where we bring Sunday home. Join us as we dive deeper into First Baptist's weekly sermons, discuss practical applications, and answer your questions. Hello and welcome to the Beyond Sunday podcast. I'm Jordan Upton, and with me as always is Pastor Jeff Reynolds. Jeff, how are you doing today? Doing great, Jordan. I have had now for the first time in my time at First Baptist Church the opportunity to be fed uh, while in the room. Uh, there have been several other folks who've preached here over the years, but I've always been outside the room when that happened. And so it was nice to hear from Ben uh, and to, uh, to be spiritually fed uh, during the worship service here in person. So that was really something, and I'm still uh, enjoying that and kind of replaying that experience. So uh, doing well. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank God. Uh, one of my boys is a little little under the weather, so I decided to stay here. Poor guy. Uh, not, uh, not hug it out with you guys and then hope for the best. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. I'll tell you, we we played football in the middle of a cornfield this past Friday night. And it, I mean, when I say in the middle of a cornfield, I mean, everywhere you looked, there was corn around us. And our entire family is sniffling and <laughs> dealing with the, the allergic after effects of being in a cornfield. Thankfully, we won the game. It was a nail biter. But... Um, yeah, I can appreciate this is uh, this is that time of year where you catch it on the back half. You know, in the spring you get the pollen, and in the fall you get the dust from the harvest. But you're thankful for the harvest and all the things. So, yeah, was that Field of Dreams? Did you see James Earl Jones there? Nobody walked out. James Earl Jones was not there. But what a voice! Oh, he he just recently passed away. Uh, that's kind of a different conversation. I got to see him in person at Center College. He came and spoke and uh, led a convocation at Center College. And I'm going to tell you, what a gift to have that voice. Um, My goodness. Amen. Yeah. Well, and circling back to Dr. Ben Mandrell, the CEO and president of Lifeway, uh, spoke and delivered the message on Sunday. It's a great message. Uh, listeners, if you didn't get to be there in person or listen to it, then listen to it online. We've got the link in our show notes. Um, but he talked about Mark 2, Mark chapter 2, specifically the story of the paralytic man and the uh, friends that he had who lowered him down so that he would be healed by Jesus. Uh, we're going to kind of talk about that you know, a little loosely. Uh, we're not necessarily going to read the whole story, but we're going to talk about small groups, which is really what Dr. Mandrell was talking about. Um, just small groups, the dynamic of them, and what it's like living in community as a uh, believer. Uh, So first of all, before we get into that at all, I'm just going to assume we need to start from the ground up and define things and work our way uh, outward. So can you define what a small group is? Yeah, it's a great question. A small group is a group of varying size tending towards small, (laughs) and I'll explain (laughs) that here in a minute, Um, that is intentional about meeting together, studying God's Word together, praying for each other, and doing life together. I mean, that is... uh, Ben mentioned in his sermon that in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, uh, that the, the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And those are four things that uh, I think are part of um, small groups to some degree. So there's the apostles' teaching, which we have recorded as the scriptures. Um, there's the fellowship, which is the coming together of God's people to encourage one another and to stir one another toward love and good works. Um, breaking of bread, we Baptists like that. You know, that doesn't mean you have to have a potluck, but it does mean that there's something to be said about sharing a meal together, sharing uh, sharing God's sustenance together, and and having that time. Um, and and to prayer. And so I think that that any group that is intentional about doing those sorts of things is what the Bible would describe as a biblical small group. Now, I say a varying size because both in the church where I previously pastored and in our church here today, um, we have groups that are way too large to be considered small. Uh, We have one Sunday school class that is larger than the average Southern Baptist church. And, uh, And the experts say that shouldn't work. It's too big. 
Um, but they are uh, some of the closest brothers and sisters in Christ uh, in our church, and, and they do things to fellowship with each other. They break bread together, and sometimes that bread is homemade ice cream, and uh, sometimes that bread is is deep-fried crappie. Um, but they, they get together and, and enjoy one another. And then we have other groups that are, you know, just – a few couples that get together, but they're intentional about getting together. They're intentional about praying for one another. They're intentional about learning from God's Word together and then applying God's Word in their lives. And so um, that's how I would describe a small group. Yeah. Well, so picking up on that, Dr. Mandrell talked about how really we at times have to rely on the faith of others. You know, we, um, I mean, logically so, we talk about, you know, having faith, and you know, walking your walk with Jesus, um, but we really also need people. Like we, we really were in some sense made to be within a community. Can you kind of talk about how God made us to made us specifically to exist within a community? So if we go back to the creation of the very first human being, Adam in the Garden of Eden, we know that Adam was there and that he was in perfect communion with God and all the animals were there. Uh, And yet the Lord said, after all of these things were good and even very good, uh, that the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. That's Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. God goes on to say, I will make a helper fit for him. And so then we get the account of Adam naming the animals. And so if you're wondering why the duck-billed platypus is called the duck-billed platypus, well, talk to Adam about that when you get to heaven. Um, But the Lord God, in verse 21, caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Well, this passage is not just about marriage. This passage is about the fact that God created us to live in community. And if you think about the very nature of God himself, the ontology of God is Trinity. He is triune. So there is is oneness within the community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we are made in his image. What's interesting is the the word um, that is used in Genesis chapter 2, that they shall become one flesh, is the Hebrew echad. And when you go to the Shema of Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's the same word there, echad. You have oneness within the community of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God is saying, as he has now created man and woman in the image of God, that in the marriage union they would have oneness, ekad. They would be one within the context of community, husband and wife. And so that's it's very interesting that God created us in his image, but he created us as social beings to exist within the context of community. And that's a very important thing for us to grasp. And so often, particularly uh, in a post-COVID world, there is an ease with which we can isolate ourselves. And God did not intend for us to live our lives that way. Uh, He intended for us to live within the context of community and not just community found on social media, not just community found through a screen, but, but true, vibrant, living community where human beings interact with one another uh, in a face-to-face sort of experience. And so absolutely God created us to live as, as social beings within the context of community, uh, and that community can vary based on even different seasons of our own lives, but he created us nevertheless to live within the context of community. It is not good, he said, that the man should be alone, and the same is true for all of us. We need one another. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, uh, I'm I glad you talked about Genesis because that that really frames it all. That really makes sense of, well, how humans get lonely, you know? Like, we, we weren't made to be individuals. We weren't made to be 
uh, islands, as the saying goes. We were made to exist with other people. Uh, marriage, of course, you know, we always think of marriage when we read Genesis 2, but like you're saying, it, it, it shouldn't be limited to that. It's, you know, we're, humanity is, um, and I don't know, an entity, I guess, a singular entity in some sense. Um, I, I, you know, it, it, uh, it also makes me think of some of the passages leading up to Mount Sinai where, uh, the Hebrew uses singular pronouns when talking about Israel. So it's like, it was a singular nation that approached the mountain. It wasn't, you know, uh, in individuals from the tribes, you know, following Moses or going there. It was like, no, 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 this is like one unit that was approaching God. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's what we're supposed to be. Yeah. Well, and let me say to, to our listeners who are single, um, there's also biblical reference to what it looks like to live unmarried within the context of the Christian faith. We have a pretty good example in, oh, I don't know, God in flesh who dwelt among us. Regardless of what Dan Brown said uh, 20 years ago, Jesus was not married. He was not married to Mary Magdalene or anybody else for that matter. And yet, notice that Jesus still lived in vibrant community. To a degree that even now on social media, you will see people posting memes that say, you know, one of the greatest miracles of the life of Jesus was that he was a 33-year-old dude who had 12 friends. <laughs> and so, and I can resonate with that as I had to find friends because my wife had more bridesmaids than I had people I knew. And so I had to go digging in the woods for people to come stand up next to me in my wedding so that they would match with the other side, you know? Um but Jesus, who was unmarried, had companions. He is God in flesh. Uh, the Apostle Paul, who was unmarried, always had community, with the exception of his time in Athens. You, you think about Paul's missionary journeys, and the only time he was alone was when he was in Athens. The rest of the time, even when he was under house arrest, you know, he had people with him. He had community around him. And so don't feel, if you're not married, like you're in any sense less than. Um, my goodness, Jesus Christ himself was unmarried. And so nevertheless, we see that that communal life, that, that life within the context of a community of other people, intentional community in Christ— um, that was very much a part of Christ's life, very much a part of the Apostle Paul's life, and very much a part of the early church. So, again, of course, you know, if, you, if you're married, your husband, your wife, that is your closest community. You have children in the home, that is your closest community, and that is your first call to make disciples within the context of your home. But if you're single, don't feel like you're in any regard less than because you're not. How could you be less than? Uh, if Jesus was single? Uh, how could you be less than if Paul was single? And certainly Jesus and Paul were not in any regard less than in anything. So, Yeah, awesome, awesome point. So the, the biggest takeaway I personally had from Dr. Mandrell's sermon was when he was talking about the peaks, pits, and transitions of life. So he said it's important, yeah, it's important to be in community and really feel affirmation during the peaks, pits, and transitions of life. He talked about the peaks and the pits, and those, those kind of make sense. You know, it's when you're, when you're celebrating something, you know, you, you want people to be with you. When you're uh, mourning, uh, you want to have people with you. But it's the transitions that he said don't really get enough airtime, and um, I, I really thought that that was an interesting point, so I want to hammer home on that one. So, he, again, he said that it doesn't get enough airtime. Transitions, when we get uh, new jobs, when we move, uh, just, I don't know, re retirement. Like, these are big things that happen in our lives that we really want people to be there with us, but sometimes we don't necessarily think to uh, uh, carry that out. So how can we better invest in each other during the transitions in life? Well, what's interesting is if you look uh, at psychology, they will publish lists of things that are the most stressful moments in life. And of course, the loss of a loved one, and they even will list the loss of a spouse, the loss of a child, the loss of a parent, you know, various things. And, and so there are varying degrees of difficulty of navigating those sorts of things. But right up there at the top 
is a transition to a new job, a transition to a new home, a transition to a new city. And anybody who's ever done that, anybody who's ever gone away to college, anybody who's ever moved even into a new neighborhood within the same city, anybody who's moved to a different place and had to establish themselves there understands just how difficult that can be. I mean, my goodness, I have lived in Bowling Green with the exception of moving away to Danville, Kentucky for four academic years of college. Um, I've lived in Bowling Green my entire life. And when in 2016, I left Hillview Heights Church to come to First Baptist Church, didn't move houses. I slept in the same bed. Uh, you know, nothing changed as far as that went. But the way that I navigated this city changed. Uh, my working environment changed. My church family changed. You know, that was a massive upheaval. And so I think that that's an important point, And I think it was very well made. Incidentally, Ben told me after the sermon that he just recorded his first Bible study for um, Lifeway. And that this was one of the sessions from that Bible study that that he preached. And so I would encourage you, um, I don't know if that Bible study has come out yet or not. I believe it's called Together, he said, um, but it's worthwhile. And so I would look it up. But um, I think it's so vital that we recognize that when people are in transition, they are stressed and there's a lot of pressure. I mean, just the pressure of trying to get your utilities turned off and your utilities turned on and all those sorts of things. You know, how wonderful is it that when you're moving out of a home or into a home that some of your friends bring you dinner? I mean, that doesn't, it doesn't even have to be much. It can be, a, hey, I ordered pizza for you. It'll be there at this point in time. Um, or I ordered DoorDash for you, or what can we pick you up from your favorite restaurant, or this is our favorite restaurant in this new area where you've never been. Let us get you something from here just to, to take some of the pressure off. And so it's just so vitally important. So I think that that, that was very uh, a point very well made, that we, that we celebrate with people in the peaks, that we walk alongside people in the pits, and that we show up during times of transition. And so specifically within the context of our church, you know, Ricky and Sandra Clark, uh, who were with us for seven and a half years, Ricky serving as our minister of music, just moved away to Jackson, Tennessee. And during the course of their time of moving, you know, I got to keep in contact with them. And and even we had some folks from the church go over and help pack them up and, and get them out, you know, get them on their way to Jackson where they're living now. And then when it got to Jackson, uh, I got to see a Facebook post of some longtime friends from years ago showed up and, and just brought dinner. And what a blessing that was to them. And so I think so many times we can hesitate to say, uh, they don't, they don't want to be bothered right now. And there is some sense in which, you know, call first, text first. I think that's a good lesson for all of us. Um, but, you know, don't just show up knocking on the door. It's not 1963 anymore. Um, but, you know, give, it, give us a little notice. But yes, you know, bless us, bring us food. And, and even that transition, and Jordan, you, you've experienced this a couple times recently, the transition of welcoming a new member into your family and into your home, having a baby, um, those moments where you're just, life is so overwhelming because you're trying to adjust to the new moment. Um, to not have to think about dinner <laughs> is a big deal. Uh, to not have to think about just little things. Um, you know, I'm finding that, that one of the greatest gifts you can give to, I mean, one of the things that we like to give is, is, you know, gift cards to big box stores, whatever that may be, um, whether that's Walmart or Target or Kroger or whatever, pick your favorite big box store. But, you know, um, to, to take that pressure off of people and, and particularly right now, good night, trying to buy groceries is, is a nightmare. And when you add in, let's say they brought home a new baby and they're, they're buying diapers now. I mean, diapers are expensive. And so, um, you know, just showing up to ease some of that transition can be such a blessing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and thinking about uh, each of my son's birth, I remember some of the conversations and texts that I got that, you know, were just people just checking in or, you know, I would, uh, you know, t I, I might text a family member or a friend or something like that, you know, oh, here's a picture. And, you know, they'd follow up with questions and, you know, like that, all of that matters, you know, every, every little bit that you can pour into a connection with someone and who's going through a change is, is meaningful. 
And, you know, I was thinking about the way that I would do it and uh, a way that I would like to start implementing more. You know, if someone's moving away or changing jobs or something, you know, I use Google Calendar all the time for my work, you know, or just personal stuff. Like, it doesn't take much just to be like, all right, in a month, you know, here's create a reminder. I'm going to check in with so-and-so. You know, here's, I don't know, two months, make another reminder. You know, that was something that came to my mind that I thought to share. That's a Um, great idea. Any little thing like that is really meaningful. And if you've been on the receiving end of uh, texts and letters and visits uh, after calls, um, then you know how important and meaningful those things are. Well, I'll tell you, we were going through a difficult time as a family uh, within the last, I don't know, five or six years. And we had another family from within the church um, say, and this was amazing. They said, we are going to text you every single day some sort of encouragement, sometimes a Bible verse, sometimes just letting you know we're praying for you. Do not ever respond to us. We don't want you to respond. We don't need you to respond. Uh, We want you just to get that and to know that you're on our minds and our hearts and our prayers, that we're here for you and we love you and we want to remind you of some truth during this time. And my goodness, what a blessing that was. And what a great way to just bless people. Um, You know, and I think it's important, all the things that he mentioned, celebrating at the peaks, you know, celebrating people is a big deal. And uh, I think we can probably all think of moments where, It would have been so meaningful if somebody had showed up, and the fact that they didn't show up for that celebration kind of hurt our feelings a little bit. And, um, you know, we kind of keep that in mind. And I say that with frailty, knowing that I'm certain there are things that I haven't showed up for for people, and and it breaks my heart. But to seek to be intentional about those things. Um, And and then also, again, you know, we live in an age in which communication is so different. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll remember when my dad died, and this has been... 17 years ago now. You know, at some point, I didn't want any more phone calls because I was exhausted. And I felt like I had to answer the phone every time it rang and all those sorts of things. Um, But there is something to be said for a text message that says, I love you. I'm praying for you. I am here to serve you and be helpful to you in any way I can. Do not feel any pressure to text me back, but just know that I'm here if you need me. I mean, there's something so beautiful about that, that you can just walk away from your phone and maybe try to rest, maybe, you know, eat some fried chicken that somebody dropped off or, you know, something. Um, but just that touch, just that, that, that uh, recognition that they care, they're available, they love me, they're praying for me, um, but I don't have to stop everything that I'm doing to entertain them on the phone. Um, I mean, that's a meaningful thing. I just really want to encourage you all. um, Take those steps. And, uh, you know, a text message is is a great way to let somebody know in real time that you're thinking about them. 100%. There's a lot of power in the don't text back kind of text. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that'll take us into today's practical application question. So we've been talking about small groups, but not everyone's been in a small group before and it might sound kind of intimidating you know it's something new it's something that someone might not have been in before you know we've kind of defined it but you know any kind of new social venture is kind of intimidating so how does someone join a small group and what what's really entailed in being in a small group you know, um, I would encourage people to reach out to Alex Watkins, who is our Minister of Adult Discipleship and Missions, and he can help get you connected um, in a very practical way. But let me speak to that intimidation, because you're exactly right, okay? When you get around a church, no, it's kind of like social media. Nobody in the church is is going to greet you by saying, I'm such a mess. And and maybe if there is somebody that greets you saying, I'm such a mess, maybe you're scared to be around them anyway. But everybody feels less holy than everybody else when, when you're around church people. And so it can be really intimidating. I'm not going to go in a place where they might make me talk or they might make me pray or they might make me read that section of the Bible with all the names in it and there's no way and they're going to think I'm dumb and illiterate. And, you know, 
I mean, all of those thoughts are very real in people's minds, and they've been real in my mind. And I mean, I have led groups and led seminars of people that, you know, I go in with such imposter syndrome of thinking, you know, what's it going to take for them to realize that I'm not nearly as holy as I should be, and I don't know as much as I should know, and all these sorts of things. Everybody deals with that. So just know that. And I will be honest with you in my experience, the people who, um, I guess, kind of have their peacock feathers of their holiness out the most in those sorts of settings uh, tend to be the most insecure. Uh, about where they are in their walk with the Lord. So just know you are not alone. All of us are on a journey of growth in Jesus Christ, learning and knowing and and growing along the way. And so um, just be encouraged in that way, okay? You're not going to walk into a room where everybody's an expert and you're the novice and they all know everything and you know nothing. That's just not the reality, okay? Okay. But the other thing is this, just know that standing up and stretching out and taking that step of faith, you might even call it a leap, taking that step of faith will result in profound blessing in your life. I can tell you from multiple times of experience going all the way back to when I was in college and standing up and joining, uh, stepping out to join a couple of groups. There was a group when I was a, a sophomore in college. I got invited to join a group of upperclassmen who met every Thursday night for a Bible study that was taught by Dr. Ellis, who was a physician in town, uh, who had played football at Center College. But Brian Ellis uh, was about my age now. He was kind of in his mid-40s. His boys were small. Um, He was a physician in town. And every Thursday night, he got together with a group of upperclassmen, um, and, you know, they invited me in, upperclassmen men at Center College, and he brought the most amazing oatmeal chocolate chip cookies that his wife baked and brought a couple of gallons of milk. And we got together, and we ate homemade cookies, and we drank milk, and we talked deep Bible study. I mean, we started in Romans. So it wasn't like, oh, we're going to we're going to go light first. No, it was all very thick and you had to have read the passage, you had to have thought about the passage and I mean, he he told a guy while I was in there, he's like, "Look, you came unprepared. If you do that one more time, you're done. You're not going to be a part of this because we're serious about this." And so it was a big deal. I mean, that's not the way that Bible studies are at First Baptist Church necessarily. Um But, you know, this was a next level kind of a thing, and I was scared to death, and that became one of the richest experiences of my life. I stayed in that Bible study all the way until I graduated and uh, actually got to connect with Dr. Ellis about about a year ago, and we took a picture together, and I hung that picture in my uh, study at home just as a reminder of the impact that that man had in my life. And so I'm telling you, stand up, stretch out. Take that step of faith and just see what God will do in your life through other people. They are not as intimidating as you perceive them to be. I promise you that. And uh, they have just as many faults and frailties as you do. And so take the risk of stepping out, and I promise your life will be better as a result. Yeah, that's awesome. You've talked a lot, Jeff, in the past about how, you know, all of us, you know, there's Timothy, and then, you know, he's tutored by Paul, but then Paul also needs, you know, Silas, uh, you know, as uh, a peer uh, to talk to and, you know, continue his own growth. Um, Everyone has different levels where they are, and there's all sorts of Bible studies and small groups for all sorts of developmental phases. Um, Like you said, you know, that was a, a deep dive Bible study that you were in, but not all Bible studies at First Baptist and certainly not at other churches are all incredibly deep dives where you're going to kicked out if you haven't done your homework. That's exactly um, right. Yeah. I mean, you know, no matter your level, there's going to be someone there who's just a notch above you, just just one step on the ladder. Listen, and they're ready always. to be like, hey, hey, man, I got here last week. You know, I'm glad you're here. Always, always, always. It's, you know, everybody's been a freshman. And you know what it is. I mean, there's just the 
they know the building better than me. They know the room better than me. Yeah, I mean, all those things are true, but you don't get to become a senior until you have been a freshman. So take the first step and just realize everybody's growing and we grow together. And, you know, don't let the enemy lie to you and say, well, I've got everything just fine by myself. No, you don't. You really don't. Uh, people need people. That was the title of a book they gave me to read in second grade. I still have it somewhere in a box in my attic. People need people. And it's true. It is remarkably true. So I would invite everybody to to stand up and take that step of faith. Maybe you consider it a leap, but it will be a blessing in your life. I promise you. And not only that, listen to this. This is so important. If you're not a part of a group those group members are missing out on what God has given you. So you have gifts, talents, abilities, and resources that God has entrusted to your stewardship. And if you are not engaging in a, in a small group sort of atmosphere, then that group is missing out on what God gave you. So it's not just that you'll miss the benefit, but they're missing the benefit of getting to know you and getting to experience what you bring to the group as well. Absolutely. And as we've alluded to throughout the podcast, we're going to have some resources at the bottom of the show notes where you can um, watch the sermon that we've been referencing from Dr. Mandrell from Sunday. Uh, We've got his Bible study uh, together. We've got that linked in the show notes as well. And then if you've got questions about small groups, particularly about small groups at First Baptist, we're going to have Dr. Alex Watkins' email in there. Shoot him any questions you have. He's great at responding and letting you know what the deal is, what you need to do, where you need to be, what time you need to be there. And then if you have further questions about your Christian walk, if you have other questions uh, uh, beyond anything we've talked about today, go to the link in the show notes or comment on the post below with those questions, and we'll try to address them on the podcast. Jeff, can you pray us out for today? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Ben Mandrell and for Lindley and for bringing them here to share with us. Thank you for the roles to which you've called them for such a time as this and the way that they carry them out and steward them faithfully. And thank you for the teaching that we received this past Sunday. And we pray that we would take it to heart and that we would truly live life within the context of Christian community, seeking to be blessed, but seeking also to be a blessing to one another. Lord, so many times in Scripture, you tell us, you command us, Uh, to love one another, to encourage one another, to lift up one another, to serve one another. And as one of my seminary professors from years ago said, we Christians would be better off if we would learn to one another, one another. And what they meant was that we truly need to understand what it is to live out our faith within the context of Christian community, being stirred to love and good works by others, and stirring others to love and good works as well. So I pray for those listeners who've yet to take that step. I pray that you would give them the boldness to stand up and step out in faith and to become a part of a group. And if they, if they have no idea where to start, let them contact Alex and, and pray that they would be connected with just the right group of people. Uh, Lord, that they might grow in their faith and help others grow too. Father, we love you, we trust you, and we thank you that not only do you save us, but you also transform us to become more like Jesus. And you use groups for that purpose as a part of that. And so help us to be faithful, for Lord, we know you will be faithful always. We pray these things trusting you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to our channel and submit a question to the link in our show notes. For even more First Baptist content, visit firstbaptistbg.org. Our engineer is Elliot Beckley, and our editors are Chadwick Walden and Tejon Bumpus.